Okay, welcome back to the continuing lecture today for BC 308 on Revelation and Daniel. We are going to start with chapter four of Revelation. Any questions before we get started on chapter four? Any questions so far on the seven churches or any thoughts uh, that you want to share? Um, so let's go ahead with chapter four. Could somebody read for us the first five verses, please? Revelation chapter four, verses one through five. Thomas, can you read it? Okay. Celery. Go ahead, Kieran. After these things I looked, and behold, a door is standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emeralds around the throne were 24 thrones and no and on the thrones i saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads and from the throne proce proceeded lightnings thunderings and voice seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of god mm, thank you all right so revelation chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 so the Lord has shown John about these seven churches. And then he, here, he says, I, after these things, I looked. That means it's the beginning of a fresh vision. So it's like one segment is over the, about these seven churches. That's over. And now a new movie or a new segment is starting. So that's what he means. I'm seeing something new is starting. So he says, I looked. And now he sees it's like a door open in heaven. And he hears a voice um, like the sound of a trumpet, meaning a very, very powerful voice. But it is articulate. That means uh, he can comprehend. It is saying something. And what said, come up here. So God is calling John. Now, at that moment, when he says, come up here, in the spirit, he's entering through this door into heaven, into heaven. And so the voice, he hears a voice saying, come up here. I'm going to show you things which must take place after this. So these are the things out in the future. Things which must take place. So remember, uh, in, in chapter 1 and in verse uh, uh, 19, the Lord spoke to John and said, you know, uh, there are things you have seen, things that are, and things that will take place. So Revelation 4.1 is the third part. Things that will take place. He says, things which must take place after this. So these are things out in the future. So he's getting a vision. He's going into a vision. Come up here. sees a door. He's going through the door. And then he's saying, these are the things that are going to take place from in the future. And verse 2, John says, Revelation 4, 2. John says, I was in the spirit. That means now this is, you know, he's physically in the island of Patmos. He's probably sitting and writing these things down. But spiritually, his spirit is now 
inner vision and he is seeing these things. So spiritually he's seeing these things, he's hearing what's happening in the spiritual realm. Physically, uh, he's most likely, you know, sitting somewhere on the island of Patmos and writing these things down. So what does he see? Um, verse 2, he sees a throne and there are one seated on the throne. He's seeing a throne, right? He's seeing God's throne. So this we often refer to as the throne room scene. Right? He is seeing the throne room, very throne room of God. And then in verse 3, he begins to describe what he sees using colors. But he is using precious stones, stones that he knows about, to describe the colors he is seeing. So this is a very grand, grand, great and grand scene of a throne room. And there's a lot of vibrant colors, a lot of colors, different things that he's seeing and hearing and experimenting. Um, there, is, um, there is majesty, there is something very majestic about this throne room. And all John can do is he can talk about some precious stones to, to reference those colors that he is seeing. So he says, he says in verse 3, um, he who sat was like jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. That means he's saying, you know, I, I'm seeing this person on this throne and there is colors like jasper and sardis coming out. So jasper most likely refers to something very clear and brilliant. Uh, something like, um, you know, what you, we would say of a diamond. Right? Something very brilliant. So it's clear and brilliant. Sardis is a stone. It's a red color. Red like ruby. So he's seeing brilliant white or clear brightness and red. A ming, you know, a both these colors coming out of the being on the throne. Now, uh, he's just describing it using, you know, uh, stones and what he knows about that stones. He's saying, it's like, I'm seeing somebody who's like this Jasper and Sardis stone in appearance. You know, it doesn't mean God is a stone. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. It's just saying, I'm seeing these colors coming out of this person. Now, If we go by the premise that uh, everything God is doing is uh, fit, is intentional, then the reason God is getting John to see this uh, should have some meaning. And so this white light or brilliant light is talking about purity. You know, there's no, uh, what to say, no dirt, like diamond. It's, it's you know, it's perfect, no dirt. Brilliant, white, light, clear. And red, of course, talks about redemption because it talks about blood. Right? This, so if you if you go by the meaning of the colors, he's the redeemer. He's the he's the one who redeems. Red, blood. You're trying to interpret the colors. Okay. But we don't want to get too fixated on it. We know God is absolutely pure. We know God is absolute, is, is our great redeemer. We know that already. But we're just trying to put some meaning to these colors. We can do it. If we don't do it, it's fine. Uh, our theology is not based on that. Our theology is based on the rest of Scripture. Okay. But I'm just trying to say, like, okay, if God is doing all of this intentionally, what would these things mean? Uh, we can deduce some ideas. And uh, he says there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like emerald. emerald. Emerald is like greenish color. This emerald stone. It's like greenish color. And so he's saying, I'm seeing a, something like a rainbow. You know, actually, rainbow is multicolor, seven colors. But this thing around the throne is having predominantly this green, greenish color. So it's just, uh, a, a vibrant 
colors that he is seeing. And then verse 4, he says, Around the throne are 24 thrones. And he sees 24 elders who are sitting. So these elders, what can we say about these elders? First of all, they are sitting on, each one of them are sitting on a throne. They are clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. Now, obviously, the question we would ask is, who are these elders? What does all this mean? So first of all, who are these elders? So we try to understand from Revelation 4 and verse, verse 4, these are people who are seated on thrones. They're wearing white robes. They're having golden crowns. And then if you look at other places in Revelation, so if you go with me over to Revelation 19 uh, and uh, verse 10, uh, there, one of these elders, so through the book of Revelation, there are times, you know, an angel talks to John. There are times an elder speaks to John. So, we have two records here in Revelation 19.10 where uh, John is speaking with the elder and again in Revelation uh, 22 and verse 9 uh, again there's this elder speaking with John and if you look at both these verses Revelation 19.10 the elder says I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus so he's saying, I'm your fellow servant and your brethren. That means one of your Jewish brethren. And I am, I have the testimony of Jesus. That means I also give testimony to Jesus. Then you again see in Revelation 22 and verse 9, the elder, one of the elders says, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets. And of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. So he's saying, I'm your fellow servant. And I'm one of the old, one of the prophets, could be the old, old Testament prophets. So based on these scriptures, we can say that these uh, elders are, are people. They're not angelic beings or they're not uh, some others. They are people who died, who are now there in heaven. And also, what else can we say? We say that these elders have received their reward because they are wearing a crown. And uh, we see that a crown is uh, promised as a reward to the believer. And we are seeing them seated on the throne. Now, we just read in Revelation 3.21 that the throne is promised to a believer who overcomes. And we see that these elders are wearing white robes. Uh, so again, white robe is promised. Uh, we saw this earlier in Revelation 3 and verse 5. Uh, it is promised to a believer who's an overcomer, white robe. So crown is given to a believer who overcomes. Uh, uh, the throne is given to a believer who overcomes. And um, the, uh, uh, the uh, white garment is given to a believer who overcomes. So just based on all of these, you know, clear indicators, we can say that we can say uh, that these elders are actually believers in Jesus Christ who have overcome, who have received their rewards. So what else do we, what else can we identify about these elders? Now, Based on Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus told his 12 apostles, he said, you will sit with me around my throne. Matthew 19, 28, he told his apostles. So it is likely that 12 of them could be the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Likely, I'm not saying for sure, I'm just trying to connect scripture, try to get some clues on who are these 24 elders. We have established the 
fact that they are definitely human beings. They're not angelic beings. Um, one of the elders said, I'm your fellow servant and your brethren, meaning he's a Jew. One of the elders said, I'm your fellow servant and of the prophets. So it gives us some clues. Jesus told Matthew 28, 19, 28 to the apostles, you will all sit with me on, on thrones with me. So it could be 12 of them are the 12 apostles. That's not including Judas. Of course, Judas was replaced by Matthias. And um, the other reason we see is that in uh, Revelation chapter 21, uh, uh, the 12 tribes are mentioned, Revelation 21, verse 12, and Revelation 21, verse 14, the 12 apostles are mentioned. So in the new city of Jerusalem, the 12 apostles are honored by being the 12 foundations of the city. The 12 tribes are honored by being given the names at the gates of the city are given the names of the 12 tribes. So, and also if you look at what we saw earlier, Revelation 21, um, so Revelation 22, verse uh, 9, uh, one of the elders said, I am your fellow servant and your prophets. So maybe he's, the other 12 are, you know, uh, Old Testament prophets whom God has chosen. So this is only, uh, you know, this is just trying to guess, okay? I'm not saying <laughs> for sure, but based on all these scriptures, what we can say for sure is these 12, these 24 elders are people. They're not angels because they have already identified themselves. I'm your fellow servant. What we can guess is 12 of them are the 12 apostles. The other 12 could be prophets from the Old Testament. Whom, 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 or sorry, whomever the Lord has chosen from the Old Testament. Because, you know, what we read in 22, Revelation 22, 9, he said, I am your fellow servant and of the prophets. So based on that clue. But the other thing that we can conclude is Revelation chapter 4 is giving us a scene in heaven after believers have received their rewards. You so say, why? Because these people are seated on the throne, which is a reward. These people are wearing crowns, which is also a reward. And they're waiting, wearing white garments, which is also a reward. So that's what we are saying. Revelation 22, uh, Revelation chapter 4 is starting from the time when the believers are in heaven and they are, they have been given their rewards. So this leads us to the conclusion that the rapture has already taken place before the scene of Revelation 4 because the believers are in heaven now we know that when a believer dies right now, the body disintegrates on earth, the spirit goes into heaven. And we know that there is coming a time when believers will be judged. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and they will be given rewards. So, what we are, again, thinking through on this, right? It's not stated here, but we're thinking through based on what we're seeing. That most likely, by the time Revelation 4, the scene in the future is being shown to John, the rapture has taken place. Believers are up in heaven. Rewards have been given. And these 24 saints perhaps 12 of them Old Testament saints, 12 of them the apostles have 
been ushered into their place of honor as a reward and they're seated there. So to me, that, that, that uh, seems like a very uh, valid uh, thought, a very valid uh, conclusion. I don't uh, you know, find any problem with it. So uh, uh, that's why, you know, that's one of the reasons we say uh, by the time Revelation 4 starts, the rapture has taken place. The believers have received their rewards. And here everything in the throne room is. God is seated on this, in this magnificent throne. These people are, these people have been honored to be given, you know, 12 thrones on one side, 12 thrones on the other side. These are the apostles. These are the uh, Old Testament prophets. People are, you know, are people from the Old Testament who have been honored by God. And uh, that's the scene he sees. And then he says in verse 5, from the throne proceed lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Meaning, it's something, you know, Paul, uh, John just uses words. He says, says, you know, it's like from the throne, there is something so powerful. It's like a, a combination of lightning and thunder and voice sound. You know, he's just trying to say, there is this brilliant light and brilliant sound meaning it's overwhelming. It's beyond what he can describe. He's only capturing it in, you know, in words and pictures and language he has. That's why he's using, you know, it, these are the colors I'm seeing and he's using precious stones. And he's saying, this is what I'm, it's just so off, uh, awesome, so amazing. It's like the sound of lightnings and thundering and all voices coming out of the throne. Very, very majestic very powerful, overwhelming. And there he sees the Holy Spirit. Verse 5. He sees seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. So seven lamps. And he says these seven lamps are the seven spirits of God. And we already explained from chapter 1. The phrase seven spirits of God represents the one Holy Spirit. So that means he's saying, look, the uh, you know, so God is helping him understand that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is there in the throne room. God the Father on the throne, God the Spirit present right there before the throne. And, he's, and, he, and, and the image, the visual image that is used to communicate the presence of the Holy Spirit is the seven lamps with fire. And so this is the perfect Spirit of God. So in the throne room, God the Father, brilliant color, sound, oh, magnificent sound, the throne, 24 elders who have received their rewards, clothed in white crowns on the thrones, and God the Spirit in the throne room. Okay. So far, everybody's with me. Any questions? Okay. I see your um, yes in the chat, clear in the chat. Okay, so that's fine. So what does he see happening in the throne room? Right? So verses 6 to 11. Somebody could read that, please. Revelation 4, 6 to 11. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like a crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front of, in feet and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes 
are round and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures yeah. give glory and honor and thanks to him on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him, who sits on the throne and worship him, lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things by your will. They exist and were created. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, now verse 6. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. So he's saying, uh, there's a crystal clear glass, uh, a sea of glass, meaning it's like this huge, wide, you know, sea. So when you imagine a sea, it's like this limitless surface of water. In other words, he's saying like, I'm seeing something so limitless, but it's uh, clear like crystal, meaning it's, it's so perfect, so clear. And it's, it expands as limitless around the throne. And uh, there he says, I'm seeing Four living creatures. Could they have been more? Could be. But this is what he saw. And then, it's very strange. So these, of course, are referring to angelic beings, four living creatures. They're angelic beings, or other, sometimes we refer to them technically as cherubims, angelic beings. And, uh, in verse 7, the sense that John is getting about each of these four creatures. Now, there could be more, right? There could be more, but he's only seeing four. Like we said, you know, he only saw seven churches. There was a message given only to seven churches when they were actually... But, you know, God is giving him... a a glimpse. He's not necessarily seeing everything in heaven, but he's he's seeing a glimpse, a piece, and he's recording that for us. So he's seeing these living creatures around the throne, these angelic beings, and he's just using, you know, what he can understand from our earth. He's using that to say, like, it looks like this, or has this characteristic. So a lion, a calf, face like a man, and an eagle. Lion, this is verse 7, Revelation 4, 7. The living creature, one was like a lion, other was like a calf. Third was like a man, had a face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of these had six wings full of eyes around them. And they do not rest day or night, saying. Now, for us, as we read these two verses, it's like I can't, <laughs> I can't even imagine what these creatures would have looked like. Right. So my my thought here is let's not worry too much about these living creatures other than they were angelic beings. And John is trying to say in a very simple way what he felt about these creatures. So talking about lion, they're talking about something very powerful. A calf talking of something very timid man because relating to us people. An eagle, a flying eagle 
something that sees from a distance, something that, you know, as a bird is very powerful. So that's what we can say. And uh, them having six wings, if you connect it to what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter one, uh, when he saw the cherubims, he saw them moving very fast and so on. And so maybe the wings are representing their ability to move very fast. And they're full of eyes around and within, which again is very, very strange. You know, how do you picture that? Something like that. But maybe that's just showing that they could see everything. These, angel these angelic beings could see everything. So what I want to just put forward is, uh, don't be so, um, uh, or you know, confused or overwhelmed or taken up by trying to figure out exactly what these angel, angelic beings are, these living creatures are, uh, because it's very confusing to put all of them. You know, how do you imagine a man, an angelic being, the face of a man, six wings, eyes everywhere? What is it? Very strange. But if we just take them as this is the sense John got when he saw these living creatures. Does it mean that these living creatures look exactly like that? But the sense that he got when he saw these living creatures, we can take it to mean, um, you know, this was kind of a character of that living creature. One was like a calf, very timid. Uh, and it was, it was very... It could move anywhere in the spiritual realm and it could see anywhere in the spiritual realm. So that's why he said calf with six wings and eyes everywhere. One was very strong, like a lion. Wings, it could move anywhere. See, could see anywhere. Eyes everywhere, it could see anywhere. So that was that living creature. So we take it like that. Again, you know, this is only uh, uh, a thought that I'm sharing. I'm not, you know, we can't, say anything for sure uh, because it is not very obviously i would say it's very confusing if you try to piece verses seven and eight together but there are these angelic beings around the throne we just refer to them as cherubims seraphim seraphims and cherubims seraphims are primarily worshiping creatures uh, cherubims are involved in worship but they also go out to do certain things when god wants them to do um, and then there are there are messenger angels, and then there are the warring angels. So there are different kinds of angelic beings, and we are seeing some of them here in verses 7 and 8. But these angelic beings, verse 8, are involved in constant worship. They, they don't rest day or night. They're just constantly worshiping before the throne, seraphims and cherubims. They're just constantly worshiping and, you know, they may be sent out to do certain things from time to time. And uh, very interesting, the one attribute of God that they are constantly worshiping is His holiness. Holy, holy, holy. It's very interesting. That means... The throne room is filled with the awe and the sense of the holiness of God, the perfection of God. And then they say, Lord God Almighty, the sense of his power, he's almighty. And who was, who is, and is to come, his eternal attribute. He was who is, who is to come, meaning he lives outside time. So what do we see being mentioned here in the throne room? The holiness of God, the almightiness of God, and the eternal attribute of God. The one who is outside time, you know, just being worshipped, saying, God, this is who you are. You're absolutely holy. You're absolutely almighty. And you're absolutely eternal. They're worshiping God. And uh, as they are worshiping God, 
the saints, the 24 elders who are the redeemed saints, who are people who've been honored there in the throne room. They bow down and worship God. And they're saying, Lord, you are worthy to receive all the glory and honor and power. You are created. So they're recognizing you are creator. We are created beings. And by your will, we exist. So they are worshiping. So in the throne room, worship. Worship is so important. Now, what John does not see, and uh, it's not recorded for us, is if before the throne is a sea of glass, like crystal, it's very possible that great multitudes of people are on that sea of glass, also involved in worship. And we, we, will, we will see coming later on in uh, Revelation, uh, I think 11, and again in Revelation 15, uh, you will see uh, that uh, on the sea of glass, actually I'm looking at Revelation 15 verse 2, uh, there are these people who have been redeemed who are standing and worshipping God. Revelation 15 too. So it's quite possible that, uh, you know, uh, although um, John has described the throne room with 24 elders and these angelic, four angelic creatures, it's quite possible there are so many others on the sea of glass, like we see in Revelation 15 too, are just worshiping God. So what would it be like when you and I are there? When you and I are standing on that sea of glass like crystal, I mean, I, I, I don't know, it's probably, it's, it's just, you know, it's hard to imagine what it's like. But we are in this presence where everything is so clear. And there's just pure worship. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. And everybody's just worship. The living creatures, the elders, and all those who are standing on that sea of glass are just worshipping God. And God is such that uh, you and I may be amongst you know, millions of others standing on that sea of glass, worshipping. But God is such that it's as though you are worshipping him alone. So even though there are great multitudes, it's like just you and God in that throne room on that sea of glass and you're worshipping. I wonder how it feels, you know, I wonder how, it, how we would feel when we are there in that, but that is coming. Thank God. Chapter 5 he continues his vision. So the vision in the throne room continues. Uh, let's uh, read verses 1 to 7, please. Revelation 5, 1 to 7, please. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back seal with seven seals then i saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll scroll and to lose its seals and no one in heaven or no no the no the earth or, or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it so i wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look 
at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribes of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and looked the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Mm. Thank you. So, the, the vision is continuing. And John is seeing now, he's seeing that on the throne, God the Father, sorry, he has in his right hand a scroll. And there is something written inside and outside the scroll. So, the scroll. The scroll often is used to represent uh, the word of God, the prophetic word, things that God is speaking, what has he has spoken. And uh, very interestingly, when we looked at Daniel, in the 12th chapter, the angel told Daniel, Daniel, whatever I have spoken to you has been sealed for the end of time. You know, this is uh, Daniel. Um, Chapter 12 and uh, verse, this here? Uh, verse 4. The, um, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Right? So in other words, uh, and then he says, says this again in verse 9. Uh, Daniel, the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. So Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 12. Uh, verses 4 and 9, the angel had spoken and said to Daniel, you know, Daniel, they are sealed till the time of the end. That means till that time, it's on hold, it's on pause. But then the time will come when those words will begin to be fulfilled. So we are there in Revelation 5.1, we are there. Those words that have been spoken by the prophets, which God has spoken through the prophets, they've been sealed and they're waiting to be fulfilled. So that's the scroll. And uh, notice John, he says, a strong angel with a loud voice. See, there's a strong angel, so a sense of strength he can get when he sees this particular angel. And is speaking with a very loud voice, very strong voice. Who can open the scroll? And uh, the sense John gets is, nobody can. So he weeps. And even this expression is, a weep weeping is in the spirit, right? Because on the earth, John is sitting and writing the revelation. But spiritually, he's having this experience. He's seeing, he's hearing, he's feeling all these things. So um, the spiritual man is as real as the natural man. The natural man is sitting and writing these things. Spiritual man is experiencing, seeing all these things. And um, then one of the elders come and say, hey, John, don't weep. And he refers to Jesus, says the lion of the tribe of Judah. So look at how Jesus, the son of God, or uh, the eternal word, how he is, uh, the titles that are being used. The lion of the tribe of Judah. I mean, this is the most powerful one from the tribe of Judah. He's a root of David. That means he's a descendant of David referring to his earthly lineage. Uh, Judah also referring to his earthly lineage. He is the one who can open the scroll. That means to open the scroll means start fulfilling these things. The time for the fulfillment of all these prophecies has come. So literally, when Jesus comes forward, and opens a scroll, he is, you know what to say, starting the time to fulfill everything 
that is written in the scroll, the prophecies that have been given. They've been sealed to the time of the end. But now it'll start. So, John sees, verse 6, he sees a lamb as though it had been slain. So again, another reference to Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb as though it had been slain. You know, all pictures of Jesus. So we are seeing in the throne room, we have seen God the Father, we have seen the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. Now we are seeing God the Son or the eternal word, Jesus Christ. And interestingly, in verse 6, he says, this lamb, as though it has been slain, has seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. So Jesus, the lamb of God. So again, remember, all these are pictures he's seeing, but it's actually representing the person of Christ. The lamb of God, Christ. The lamb of God has seven horns. Seven represents perfection. Horns represents dominion, power, authority. That means here is the one who has all authority, perfect authority. And he's having this. The seven horns and seven eyes represent the seven spirits of God. He says that in verse 6. So the lamb is anointed by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is represented by seven horns and seven eyes as upon the Lamb. So we know Jesus was anointed. The seven spirits of God is the Holy Spirit. Seven horns talking about perfect dominion. Seven eyes talking about perfect knowledge. Eyes, omniscience, knowledge. So what I want, to, want you to see is the Holy Spirit is represented by seven lamps of fire, seven horns, and seven eyes. Seven lamps of fire we saw in Revelation 4 verse 5. Seven horns and seven eyes, Revelation 5 and verse 6. All representing the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, seven spirits of God. Seven lamps talking about his omnipresence because light is, you know, travels everywhere. Seven horns representing omnipotence. Seven eyes representing omniscience. He knows everything. Seven spirits of God. And the lamb has this on him. He's anointed by the spirit. And this person, verse 7, comes and takes the scroll. He's the one who's going to set these things in motion. So, he is the beginning of creation. He is also here the one who starts the fulfillment of these prophecies. So what we will see next week as we continue this is from this point on, from this point on, as Jesus begins to open the scroll, all the end time prophecies begin to be fulfilled. That is chapter 6, verse 1, starts happening. But before chapter 6, verse 1 has started, what has happened? The elders have been seated on the throne. They have received their rewards. They're clothed in white. That means the saints have been given their rewards. So something has happened in heaven before these things start here on earth. Okay? So we're going to pause here. We'll pray and dismiss him. And we will continue this next week. Um, somebody could pray for us, please. And we will dismiss. Dave, you want to pray? Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that for this time, for this uh, class, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you are with us here. Amen able to learn so much things from from from, from, the, from the from the book of Revelation and from the book of Daniel, Lord God. We thank you. We thank you for the pastor as well, Lord Jesus. We pray that this, all this lesson will help us understand more about your kingdom and the day of your kingdom to come, Lord Jesus. Help each one of us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity once again and we, we submit this time into your hand. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We'll take a break and I'll see you in the next class. Thank you. Bye now.